Hello and welcome to Choose a Fi. Today on the show, we have another fun mailbag episode, and I'm joined by my friend Rachel Camp. So this is her third visit to Choose a Fi to do a mailbag episode. And I just have a lot of fun recording with her. She's absolutely brilliant. She's always prepared. And she picks great questions from the mailbag list, which I absolutely love. So this is going to be a fun one. We have a question about Roth versus traditional. We have some interesting ones about the new rules on the 529 to Roth that just went into effect earlier in January 2024, plus setting up your children for the future and for people who just got married, how to organize your finances. I think this has a little bit of everything. So with that, welcome to Choose FI. Rachel, always good to have you here. So good to see you. Thanks for joining me. Of course. Thank you, Brad. Love being here. So happy to be back a third time. Yeah, this should be fun. So I forgot to say, of course, that you are a CFP and I really appreciate all the detail you put into this. It really, really makes for great episodes. So thanks again. And let's just kind of bomb right into this. So we're going to start off with a fun one. So this is actually in direct reference to our <laughs> last episode, which was episode 485, where we talked about the book Die With Zero and Spending Down to Zero and actually why that's kind of impractical, not really plausible, but we touched a little bit on a lot of things in that. And Jay wrote in basically saying, in the last Choose a Fight podcast with Rachel, we spent, we being you guys, spent over 30 minutes discussing the niche topic of dying with zero slash how to spend more. Not irrelevant to the fight community, but it was at the expense of the next and very relevant topic of Roth versus traditional. That discussion was rushed with basically, quote, it depends. Yes, it does. But I'd like to see you spend the 30 minutes or more needed to tease that out. So Jay, obviously, wonderful question, dripping with sarcasm. It, it's great. And and he meant well. I, so <laughs> I'm sorry, but, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we let Jay down. Yeah. So I did challenge him and say, let's be frank here, safe withdrawal rates and trying to get that right and understanding sequence of return risk and how we think about a holistic life and your money. To call that niche would be a stretch <laughs> in the very, very least. So I did kind of uh, have fun with challenging Jay on that a little bit. But anyway, beside the point. So Jay rightly said, we did very much rush by Roth versus traditional. I think this is something that a lot of people have questions about, Rachel. So I know you prepared extensively for this. So I'm just going to tee you up to let you run with it. And as always, we'll kind of play off each other a little bit here. Yeah. So I mean, I am fully prepared today to take the 30 plus minutes that it <laughs> required to go through this topic because the thing that makes it so difficult to answer in you know in a quick 30 second to 1 minute little bit is that there's so many variables which means there's so many scenarios that we could run for traditional versus Roth. So just to set, you know, the, the context for this discussion, what we're trying to accomplish here is essentially tax arbitrage. What that means is we're trying to profit from a difference in tax rates. So I'm sure Senator Roth was not aware of the debate that would ensue when he introduced the Roth account back in the 1990s. But as a result of having this other option, it has been a really fierce debate on which is the premium account. So the idea is simply, if we have an idea of what your future tax rate will be, then we can figure out what you should do. So traditional, we'd want to contribute to a traditional account, which is pre-tax money going in. This is where you're avoiding the tax today, you're paying the tax later. So you'd want to do traditional if your tax later was going to be lower. So we're avoiding today when tax is higher, we want to pay later when tax is lower. That's the idea. And then Roth, of course, would be the opposite. If tax is lower today, we want to pay that today, we want to avoid it when it's later. And the thing that I think confuses a lot of people is that if tax rates actually stay the same, meaning you're in the 25% bracket today, you're in the 25% bracket later, it doesn't matter which one you choose. So that always confuses people because they bring up the, would you rather pay the tax on the seed or the harvest? Yeah, assuming that that has the impact, but it's very important to start this conversation with understanding that if tax rates stay the same, then the result, whether you do Roth or traditional, is the exact same. Yes, 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 yes. So you could see me. You, you yeah. almost stopped there for a minute because I was jumping out of my seat. <laughs> this is the single most important thing that everyone understands. Like you said, it, like on the seed, right? So a lot of people think, oh, I'll just do the Roth and I'll pay my little bit of tax now. 
right? It might be 12% or whatever X percent on a $6,000 contribution or something. That's minuscule. That's only $700. That sounds like a tiny amount versus, all right, I'm going to take the tax deduction now in a traditional, but then when this is worth millions of dollars, five decades from now, I'm going to have to pay so much in tax. And the wild thing is when you run this side by side, as Rachel so astutely said, it's literally the same number. If, if the tax rates stay the same, if, 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 right. Mm -hmm. So this is clearly as a starting point, as Rachel said, a tax arbitrage play. So this is, will it be higher or lower than it is now? And obviously there are a lot of considerations. There are more considerations for people in the FI community, but at its heart, if the tax rate is the same, it's the same answer. Don't delude yourself into thinking otherwise, basically. Yeah. So now that we have the understanding of how the math actually works, we can bring up, you know, the variables that people always bring up, which is the number one I hear is what if tax rates change? And most of the time I'm hearing, what if they increase? Because yes, when it comes to marginal tax brackets, we are in historically low tax rates currently. So we can look at that and say, well, I believe tax rates may increase in the future. So I'd rather pay it on the Roth today. That's fine, but we also have to consider tax law changes. So the tax that you actually end up paying is not just dependent on your marginal tax rate. What we're really looking at is effective tax rate. So that's what you actually end up paying on your, your taxable income. And yes, that's impacted by your marginal tax rate, but it's also impacted by tax law. So what I mean by that is things like deductions. So what a lot of people don't realize is that as tax rates change and as they've been higher in the past, There was also differences in tax law. So there was also an increase in deductions when tax rates were higher. So if we actually look at historical effective tax rate, which is what you're actually paying, it actually has stayed relatively stable historically. So meaning during the times that tax rates increased, there was also an increase in the deductions that you can take. So we have to consider both when we're thinking about the future. Sure. Marginal tax rates may at some point increase. And actually, we're seeing that in 2025, a lot of these are set to sunset. So we will see an increase, but there could also always be an impact to tax law changes. And most importantly, the deductions that you can take. Yeah, that makes sense. And right, they're set to sunset, right? In 2025, Mm -hmm. obviously, we don't know what may or may not happen in terms of extending them. But yeah, so clearly that's set to happen. And yeah, just critically, because I think a lot of people don't have a great understanding of how our taxation system works, right? So marginal rate is the federal tax rate on that next dollar. So that's what marginal means in this regard. It's the next dollar of income. It's basically how we think of tax brackets. So it's not like when you get zipped into the next tax bracket up that all the prior dollars get taxed at that rate. It does not work that way. It's just that marginal dollar. Whereas effective tax rate is basically saying, okay, at the end of the day, I'm paying let's say $5,000 in federal tax, I have $50,000 in gross income, you just divide, right? So it's 5,000 divided by 50, my effective tax rate is 10% in that case, even though your marginal bracket is gonna be higher than that in all likelihood. So I'm just making these numbers up, of course. So it's it's very, very important to understand those general concepts, especially as, as Rachel goes through this. Yeah, and I'm just pointing out a few variables here that impact the decision. So tax rates, tax laws, I want to mention a few of the other ones too. So RMDs are a big variable. When I look at a lot of studies or scenarios that people run, one big thing they leave out is RMDs. And RMDs are required minimum distribution. So when you have money in a traditional account at a certain age, right now it's age 75, you are forced to start taking withdrawals out of that account. That is calculated by the IRS. It's not your decision. They tell you how much you have to take out of your IRA. And of course, we know you know everything taken out of your traditional IRA is taxable. So at some point, we're going to have that forced tax bill. So that's a consideration you have to make when you're thinking about traditional versus Roth, is at a certain point, you might be pushing to a higher bracket because of these RMDs. And your Social Security might be taxed higher as well. So Social Security can be taxed up to 85%. What that means is not an 85% tax rate. It means 85% of your Social Security becomes taxable. So for simplicity, let's say your Social Security is 10000 That means you'd be paid tax on 8500 of it. So that's just to mention a few of the other variables that you have to consider. 
There's Roth conversions, which are often left out. That's something that you can do when you retire early is transfer from traditional to Roth accounts. There's inheritance. There's the age that you retire, the states that you retire. There's your tax filing status. So if your spouse dies at some point, that will have a a big impact on the numbers. Or if you get married, that has a big impact on the numbers. So I just want to set the stage for how difficult this is to run in a you know narrow scope and in a clean experiment because one variable and all the numbers are thrown off and one of the, the biggest ones is if you get into retirement and you know you have the unfortunate scenario where your spouse dies that completely throws off the numbers and nobody plans or you know wants to think about that but it just shows how sensitive this yeah. experiment is now i do have a framework for it but i just want to set the stage for Ooh. it first <laughs> okay. I'm excited for this framework. Yes. Can you give a little more detail on why everything would get screwed up if the spouse, died, aside from obviously the life issue, but oh, right. how would that impact this decision? Yeah. So your tax filing status, you're single or you're married filing jointly. So what happens is if you're living off a $200,000 income and you're married, your tax bracket is going to be lower than if you're living off $200,000 in income and you're now filing single, your tax bracket is really going to increase. Okay. That is exactly what I wanted to know. So, right. Not only would the standard deduction be dramatically Half. smaller, yeah. right? Because yep. it's single as opposed to married filing joint, but the marginal tax brackets are totally different for people who are single versus married filing joint. So, okay. Awesome. All right. So there's our framework. Yes. <laughs> Let's dive in then. Yeah. So I do like to start with the rule of thumb. Now, you know, they, they have their place and I think it's a good starting point. So the rule of thumbs here, we're going to go by federal tax bracket. We're going to say 10 to 12%, you would go Roth. 22, 24%, it's a toss up. You could go either way. And then 32% and up, you would go traditional. Now we're going to customize that rule of thumb to you because everything is relative. And what it is a high 22% bracket to one person would be low to somebody else. So we have to understand that. One place where I think the rule of thumb survives, and I'm I'm curious if you agree with this, Brad, but I think it survives with the 10 to 12% in Roth because the way I think about it is paying 10 to 12% in tax and locking that in, it's just never a bad deal. That's just so low. Yeah. Yeah. It would be very, very hard to pass up at 10 to 12%. So right. Like what we're saying in essence is the only value of a traditional IRA. So it's actually, it's like the opposite way of looking at it, right? So the only value of the traditional IRA would be, since you're only in a marginal bracket of 10 or 12%, the traditional IRA would only be worth 10 cents on the dollar or 12 cents right. on the dollar. So it's minuscule. So that might suggest, okay, again, this is a tax arbitrage play, right? So if I can lock in the Roth and just pay 10 cents on the dollar or 12 cents on the dollar, maybe I want to do that now. Most likely I want to do that now and then get it tax-free for all attorney in essence. So yeah, I mean, Rachel, it would be very hard to argue with that. I think, you know, part of me, and, and we'll talk about this later after you go through your framework, but part of me says some of the real fun with the financial independence community is like, okay, if you do this right and you pay off your mortgage, you don't have car payments, your life just doesn't cost that much, and you've dumped everything into a traditional IRA, there is a real chance that you could do Roth IRA conversion ladder and essentially lock in a 0% bracket on all of that money forever. So that's like the holy grail in essence of FI. So I'm like holding on to that in the back of my mind as like, oh man, that would be hard to pass up. But, (laughs) But that said, I mean, nobody could argue with you making Roth contributions at a 10 or 12% marginal bracket. Yeah, well, let's talk about the benefits that Roth has here with that. And Roth has a certainty that traditional does not. So a lot of the the papers, I like how they phrase it, but they say the government is a silent partner in your traditional account. And it is. Your traditional account is not entirely yours yet. Now, we'd hope there'd be a way that we can get it out at 0% tax rate. But especially when RMDs start, that would be really, really hard to do. So with Roth, you know, the change in tax rates in the future has no impact to the Roth account. It's already locked in. You've already paid the taxes. With traditional, a change in tax rates could have a huge impact on your traditional account. So there's almost a risk tolerance perspective here where some people like the certainty of the Roth, especially at that 10 to 12%. They're fine with saying, you know what? 
maybe there's a strategy where I could get it over at 0% with Roth conversions. But I'm worried that for some reason that won't work in the future, that there will be variables I'm not thinking of. And I'm comfortable locking this in and then just knowing with certainty that that Roth account is entirely mine. Yeah, that's uh, that is super convincing and a brilliant point. So yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I love that silent partner. Yeah, right? like I've never heard the phrase. That, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, just pretend you did. Yeah. Because really, that, is, that is awesome. And yeah, I mean, it's true. And it's funny, because when you think about, hey, what is my net worth? And when you actually have a lot of it in traditional accounts versus Roth, I mean, at the end of the day, your true net worth is very different, yeah. which is kind of funny in that we don't think about that in the fight community all that much. So just a total sidebar. So Jay, we're, we're really diving in here. I promise. But, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> way back to the it, original Jay. <laughs> yeah. But okay. So, uh, important sidebar, but yeah, keep on rock and roll. Yeah. So let's customize the rule of thumb to you. I think one thing that's always left out of these, you know, rules of thumb is we're not paying attention to where you are in your life cycle, where you are in your career. That's really important. And nobody who you know is on a podcast or is talking, you know, on a blog, they have no idea about your situation. You are actually the best person to understand your income and where it's going. So that is really important to consider here. Feel free to take the reins and give yourself an idea of, of where it's going. So I gave the example earlier that 22% might be one person's low bracket, might be another person's high bracket. So it's important to consider where you are in your career. If you're in that 25 to 34, you're still kind of in the beginning stages. We saw that the biggest jump in income happened when you went from 25 to 34 to 35 to 44. And that was about a 20% jump in income for Gen X and millennials that they saw. So pretty big jump in income. So it's important to remember, am I just starting out and maybe I'm at a, a lower income and I, I can see the trajectory to a higher income? Or am I in my peak earning years and I, I don't really see that I'm going to be jumping up into another bracket? So to give an example, if you are 25 and you're already in the 22% bracket and you can see you know, your peers who are older than you and maybe have an idea of, of the income they're earning and the income that you could get to, 22% might still be low for you. So that 22, 24% is very situational and you might see that as low and want to lock in the Roth. If on the other hand, you're at the 35 to 44 age, you're in peak earning years or even you know older than that and you know that you're in your peak earning years, 22% might be your peak and that might be a time for traditional. That's why it's very situational and why you're the best person to decide this is, do I think I'm in my peak earning years? Do I think I'm just starting out? What's a high bracket for me? What's a low bracket? You can really look at historical earnings and start to understand that for yourself. Yeah, I like that. So look at historical earnings, like you said, for your industry, for your company, for peers, et cetera, and, and try to get a sense. But I guess I'm a little bit curious about this, where you are in this like life cycle, in essence, of your job. So let's just say that first example where you said... 25, they're already in the 22% marginal bracket. And we're kind of presupposing they're going to make significantly more, let's say when they're 35, 45, et cetera. But I guess the tax arbitrage play here is ultimately for when you start pulling the money out, right? So, you know, I think Rachel, this is where my phi brain mm -hmm. might be messing up my analysis on this, because I'm thinking that it's just in terms of, okay, what's my marginal rate? when the money's going in versus what's my marginal rate when the money's coming out. And like, I don't ultimately care what happens if I'm in the 37% bracket when yeah. I'm 35 or 40, what matters to me is like, Hey, I'm probably going to start pulling this out at 65. And I think for people in the FI community, what ultimately matters is, okay, what are my expenses? How much do I have to cover at that point? So I think that's right for a FI analysis, but like, what am I missing for like the normal person's analysis, basically? No, sure. This is the second part of the customization, and that's what are you spending? So for somebody who's 22% bracket, say they're saving 10%, they're spending everything else, you know, then it's safe to say that there's not going to be a huge tax arbitrage if they're spending most of their income. Now, if you are, I actually have clients who are in the 37% bracket spending maybe 30% of their income. To me, that's clear tax arbitrage where once they retire and they have that goal of retirement, they are going to really yes, drop. Yes, yes, yes. And so that's what you have to think about is what am I spending? 
And what percentage of that is my income? Because then you can clearly see what you are going to spend in retirement. If you're spending a lot of your income or most of it, then it becomes a little bit easier just to look at the tax bracket. So spending is one of the most important variables here. Okay. That is awesome. And that makes perfect intuitive sense once we say it out loud, right? So yeah, for the person, and regardless of whether they're a five person or a quote unquote regular person, I use that. <laughs> you know, yeah, maybe not yeah. the nicest way to put it. Uh, and <laughs> let's just say it's somebody who's quote unquote fat fi and, and their version of fat fi is, hey, I'm going to spend $250,000 a year. Well, that money has to come from somewhere, especially yeah. when there's no income coming in, right? So that means pulling out of a retirement account in all likelihood, you know, if you have exhausted your brokerage accounts at that point. So right, then that's where Rachel's analysis of kind of that peak earning, because it's really peak spending, right? It, it's really, what is your spending that matters more? Because that's what you have to pull out, basically. And if it's yeah. pulling out of a traditional account, all of that is going as ordinary income on your tax return. Right, right. And you know, this is kind of the way that you can decide it based off of a normal regular year for you. But the most important part of this framework, and this was a study done by Michael Kitchis. I, I reference him a lot. I'll send over the link so Brad can put this in the show notes. But he essentially found that the biggest impact to your wealth when you look at traditional versus Roth is not doing this, you know, 22% is Roth and 37% is traditional, but it is jumping on the extreme years. So what this means is essentially timing your Roth or timing your traditional. We talk about how you cannot time the market. It's very true, but you can time your income. You can go year by year and understand, is this a high income year for me? Is this a low income year? And that is actually what made the biggest impact to your wealth when it came to traditional versus Roth is identifying those years and jumping on them. So to preface this, a lot of people get confused about traditional versus Roth and think if they just split it, that that's a form of diversification. It's actually not because the outcome is correlated to each other. So diversification happens when we have uncorrelated variables, right? So investments, you have Apple, you have Coca-Cola. If Apple does well, that doesn't mean Coca-Cola does poorly. They're uncorrelated. But traditional and Roth, the outcome is correlated. If traditional wins and does better, that actually means Roth loses. So it doesn't mean that you can't split them, and we can get into that in a second, but it does mean that you can look for timing opportunities. That would be times where your income either shoots really high up or it drops dramatically. So I actually have an example of this in my life. Now I was doing traditional in the beginning of my career. That was probably a mistake. I okay. wish I would have gone back and done wrong. <laughs> so ignore that mistake. But when I left my nine to five, and I went to become self-employed, you know, my income plummeted. That was a year with really low income. So I actually not only did Roth, but I did Roth conversions because I was capturing at a really low tax rate. And then you would simply do the opposite when you have a big swing the other way. And, you know, I can go into more detail there, but I'll pause to see if, if that makes sense. Yeah, no. So that makes perfect sense. So, right. What you did there is like you said, you're captured. So what that meant was, and, and let's assume it was the same tax rates when this happened. So you still had some space left in the 12%, mm -hmm. maybe the 10%, but most likely the 12% tax bracket at that point. So you could basically take traditional money, traditional retirement accounts and convert it, which like I said before, when you do that, that's ordinary income. So that goes on your tax return. But if you still have some space left, let's say you had $7,000 worth of space in the 12% bracket. All right, well, that's only 7,000 times 0.12, right? Like that's a pittance. And like you said earlier, you'll take that any day of the week to do the Roth in essence on 10 or 12% bracket. So yeah, that's really, really cool and, and makes a ton of sense. Yeah. You know, and you can kind of figure out the points in your life where this happens. Maybe there's certainly going to be people out there who have a pretty steady income and it just steadily increases. But with a lot of my clients, I've noticed that there's more opportunity than maybe you would think. So just had some clients who one spouse is leaving their job and she is going into self-employment. That's a big drop in income. They've been doing traditional. They're going to switch to Roth for that year and then just pay attention to the income. Any time where you can identify a 10% swing in the tax bracket, that's a pretty good return to jump on for a tax rate change. And so when we look at tax brackets, you know, most of the time we're just increasing by two to 3% between brackets. 
except for the 12 that jumps to 22%. So if that's you, you're normally 12% and it all of a sudden jumps to 22%. So you have a big bonus. That might be a time to do traditional and, and get yourself back in the 12% if that's usually your bracket. And then two, we go from 24 to 32%. That's the other big jump. So that's something to pay attention to. If you're normally 24%, you jump up to 32, you can do traditional. Or if you're normally 32%, fall back down to 24%, that's also a big swing. So paying attention to those big swings is actually what does have the biggest impact to your wealth. And the other one people don't think a lot about, but it's state income tax. So if you're going from a state that charges 10 plus percent and all of a sudden moving to a 0% state income tax, that's a 10% swing or you know, vice versa. Yeah. Anytime you see that big swing, that might be an opportunity to jump on that. Huh. Yeah, that is fascinating. And I assume, and there's no way, just like uh, we can't give personal advice to the 100,000 plus people listening to this podcast, there's no way that we can talk to the rules of all 50 states. So right. Right, we'll leave that to you to do your own research. But conceptually, it's important to think about. So mm-hmm. I imagine, Rachel, and I'm, I'm taking my CPA's hat off because I'm, I'm not in practice at all, but I imagine there are different rules depending on, on the state and how they tax certain things. So again, we'll leave that up to the listeners to look into, but very, very important. So, okay, this is wonderful. I'm following along. So where are we going from here? Yeah. So that's what I would say is the biggest thing is you first have to understand where's your tax bracket normally, where's the big swing in the tax bracket, what am I spending, what percentage of my income, and then jumping on those big changes and going all Roth or all traditional in those years. Now, I think it's fair to say 10 to 12 percent Roth, 22 to 24 percent when there's no clear direction and you don't have a big swing, then you can actually split the contributions. I don't think that's a bad idea. And then 32% plus, I think it's fair to say traditional most of the time, unless you're one of those people who is 37% anticipates always being in a really high tax bracket, and you actually see 32% tax as an opportunity to go Roth. That's the way that I think about it. But I, I also want to make sure that, you know, Just because I say Roth and traditional is not diversification, it doesn't mean that I don't advocate for contributing to both accounts. Because the end result here is that when we do fully retire or you know move to part-time to take a step back, we want full control over that marginal tax rate in retirement. And if we're 100% traditional, you know, we have no control. If we're 100% Roth, we might be missing out on opportunities to fill up that lower tax bracket. So it still comes back to this mix of traditional and Roth and taxable. It's just a matter of when do we jump on that opportunity. And the, the big one I haven't mentioned yet is that when you retire and your income drops, that's a great time for Roth conversions and to get money over in a low tax bracket. Yeah, and that is huge. And for anybody interested in more info on that, you can just Google Roth IRA conversion ladder, choose FI. And we have a couple of case studies from a handful of years ago, but they're they're very, very relevant. The conceptual framework is the same. So that'll be outside the scope of us going into the precise mechanisms of the conversion ladder. But yeah, I mean, Rachel, that's what I talked about before, which is, oh, wow, there is especially... If your income is zero and you have then this standard deduction, let's say you're married filing joint and who knows what the standard deduction will be then, it'll be probably $40,000 or something. Assuming you had $0 of income, and again, assuming it's a $40,000 standard, you could pull $40,000 out of, convert $40,000 from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA and basically say, okay, government, please tax me. But then you get this standard deduction and it wipes yep. it down to zero. So it's, it is a $0 taxable event, which is, I mean, that's, again, the holy grail of FI, basically. Yeah. I'm really curious, Brad, your approach to this. So that That's kind of the framework. <laughs> and it's designed for you to sit down and customize it to yourself. And I hope that's enough clear direction to do so. But I think really the overwhelming point is, is outside of these extremes, you know, 10 to 12% raw, 30 plus percent traditional, it's such a close toss up that the more impactful thing that you can do is to jump on the years where there's a big change in income. Yep. I think that is wonderful, wonderful analysis. And I will answer your question and give you a little little sense of, of where I'm thinking. But for people out there who are asking the question, 
okay, is this, this is generally Roth versus traditional. So this counts for both 401k and IRAs, right? Yeah. So we didn't clarify that in the beginning, but we have Roth and traditional 401ks, Roth and traditional IRAs. And actually this is a good point where most of us are forced into some combination anyway. So even if you decide I want to do traditional 401k and you do that up to the maximum, the limit, then we have our IRAs available to us, but most of us cannot make a deductible traditional IRA contribution anyway. There's income limits for a deductible IRA contribution, and most of us are above that. So as a result, then we have the Roth IRA, and again, that has income limits, but we can do the backdoor Roth. So a strategy I really like is a traditional 401k, combine it with the backdoor Roth. Or if you like the Roth 401k, again, this is another forced split scenario here. A lot of the times they just changed this, but it's still the case for most people. Your employer match is going to be traditional. So you're already having that combination there as well. So even when we look at maxing out retirement savings and optimizing everything, we're usually forced into some type of traditional and Roth combination anyway. Hmm. That is really cool. And and yeah, I think both of us would very obviously say, please get your employer match, right? Like (laughs) in this case, I I don't think, I I don't think the people who are are looking at this question and answering, okay, is it Roth versus traditional are, are curious? Oh, I might not contribute. So obviously they're contributing. Please get your match. That's so important. So yeah, I mean, I guess for me, the way that I've always looked at this is, you know, some of these phrases that we use at Choose of I, which is control what you can control. And I think that suggests, okay, I can control my tax deduction today, which has always kind of led me to say, all right, traditional IRAs and 401ks make more sense. I'm absolutely controlling. Something you said before is I, and this is not you saying this about yourself, but what people think is I believe tax rates will increase. And I I wrote this down in capital letters, believe, because it really becomes like this, you know, people start getting into politics and like, oh, this and that with the debt and there's no way taxes, you know, you can imagine all these conversations, but at the heart of it, it's belief. Nobody can prognosticate the future. And you can look and say, all right, we have historically low marginal tax rates, yada, yada, yada. That makes sense. But like you so wonderfully went into like, okay, there's usually there's some give and take here in terms of, all right, when the marginal rates are much higher, well, then maybe there are larger deductions and things like that. So it's not like a fait accompli that that it's like a guaranteed tax rates are going to go up. It is belief. And they may go up. They may go down. They may stay the same. I have no idea. So that's why like I've always leaned towards control what you can control. But, you know, Rachel, you have uh, it's a very compelling case to say, all right, look, that's all well and good. But if you can lock in 10 or 12 percent, go for the Roth. I mean, that's pretty hard to argue against. And so, yeah, I mean, if I were in a situation like that, it would be pretty hard not to do the Roth. I still I still am holding on to that that holy grail of like, man, if I put everything in traditional and I could do Roth IRA conversion and pay zero, like I would just feel like the coolest person alive, you know, like the coolest five person alive. And I think that is very plausible for a lot of people. So I don't want to make it sound like this is some like ridiculous, like it's like an inside straight in poker or something. No, it, this is very plausible and people are doing this. So, you know, as you can tell, Rachel, I'm going back and forth because there's no right answer. And I think that is ultimately what your analysis here for the last 35 minutes went into is like, look, there's a lot of things to consider. You're ultimately guessing it's tax rate arbitrage. It's a guess that said, can you do things that make a higher likelihood of success? And I think that's where your analysis of, all right, look, 10 to 12%. Yeah. Most likely Roth 22 to 24. Yeah. You can kind of pick either. And then 32 and up. All right, look, you should do traditional in all likelihood. So I think those are really good rules of thumb. I think that's just a great analysis. And again, we're not giving financial advice to anybody, but Hey, look, you can run with what Rachel just spent the last 30 plus minutes talking about. I think that is really, really going to be effective for you. Yeah, it's a bet. And some people are comfortable betting big. Some people want to hedge their bet. So I don't fault anybody for, you know, being careful and, and using a mix. 
and maybe giving up some optimization just so they feel more comfortable. And for some people, honestly, that's locking in a Roth. Now, I would be very careful if you're locking in a Roth at a 32 to 37% bracket and just make sure that that makes sense for you. I've seen scenarios where for some people that that did make sense, actually. So I can't say there's any scenario that I haven't seen because it really is just so customized for the person. I actually have a client, really high tax bracket, but he wants to pass the assets on. He's never going to spend them. He wants to pass them on in a tax efficient manner. That's Roth. That's going to be traditional IRA. And we've considered you know, the tax bracket of his children as well and brought that into the analysis. So it, it just goes to show that there are so many different scenarios and you, you have to run this for yourself with only the variables that you know. If you were to follow a rule of thumb, if that client was to follow a rule of thumb and put everything into traditional, he'd be passing on his children you know, quite a big tax hit, which he was not the point of his money. So should be customized to you. And there's so many things this impacts. Again, like health insurance premiums. If you're going to retire early, you have a higher taxable income. That means you no longer get subsidies for health insurance. That could be a $10,000 annual expense. Irma, you know, Medicare surcharges, so many other things that this could impact your taxable income, which is why I advocate for having a mix because then we have some control over the marginal tax rate. Yeah, this is great. Jay, you're welcome. That's uh, 35 (laughs) plus minutes. But jokes aside, I think that is going to be really useful for the FI community. I think this is really, really important. And yeah, like you said, you know, another that last consideration is that silent partner, right? And like, can you lock in certainty? Like, all right, look, you know, that gives a little more credibility to Roth then. So there's a lot of things to, to think about, but you have now been armed with a whole lot of details. All right, Rachel, let's move on. We got, I guess, two very, very similar questions about this new law that you told me went into effect January 1st of 2024, where basically 529s can be converted to Roth IRAs up to $35,000. Now, both Jacob and Chloe sent this almost identical questions in. So this is something that I I don't know a ton about. So I don't know if the 35K is a, a lifetime thing. I can't imagine it's annual, but talk us through how somebody should think about this. Like what's even the high level? Let's just start there. Yeah. Like what the heck happened? <laughs> yeah. So there's a very valid concern of overfunding a 529. So basically this was Congress solution to leftover 529 funds. So you built up a 529, your child did not use all of the money. Now we're stuck with oh no, are we going to be taxed and penalized on the gains coming out of this? So this is a solution. Now, there's a lot of rules and there's a lot of gray areas with this still. So some people aren't acting on it yet, which I think makes sense because Congress has not clarified everything. So let's start there and just understand that while we have some guidelines, not every question has been answered. So there's, well, let's explain how it works. So essentially you get to transfer $35,000 $35,000 over from a 529 to a Roth account. The beneficiary of the 529 has to be their Roth account. So if your, let's just say your child's name is Sam, Sam is the beneficiary of a 529 that you set up. It has to be Sam's Roth IRA that the money goes over into. Now, the other thing is, and I, I'll, I'll bring this up to say, there's almost a way people wanted to see if they could get around this and make themselves the beneficiary, and then convert it over into their own name. Mm. There is a 15-year requirement that the account has to be open for. So oh, this wow. isn't, they're not letting you do a <laughs> hack on right. this. There's no shenanigans of There's, last minute. Like Yes, they've made it really tight here. The account has to be open for 15 years, and then you can start converting it over into the beneficiary's Roth IRA. Now, there's a limit for how much you can convert every year, and that is the annual Roth contribution limit. So if you were to start this year for 2024, uh, that's $7,000. So you could convert $7,000 over into your beneficiary's Roth IRA. The beneficiary does have to have earned income, and it's not a double dip. You can't contribute $7,000 as a regular Roth contribution and do this conversion. It's it's they add up together to the seven thousand dollars. Oh, interesting. Okay. Now, do they have to be able to qualify for a Roth IRA as it is, or like based on income and such, or is this outside the scope of that? 
No, this is the weird thing. They have to have earned income. So your child has to make at least 7,000 if you want to do the full conversion, but income limits don't apply. So, you know, normally there is a phase out for Roth IRA, where if you make a certain amount of money, you cannot contribute to the Roth. As it states today, those income limits do not apply to this conversion. Okay. So hypothetically, your child could make a million dollars and you could do this for them. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So, okay. That's good to know. That's really, really important. So I guess my first question is the 35K limit. So we're, we're using this hypothetical of Sam, right? Is that 35,000 for Sam as a human being? Or is it 35,000 for, okay, let's say I'm, I'm Sam's dad, right? Like I can do 35K and then my wife could do 35K. It's a great question. They haven't clarified. That's really? the big, yes. Oh goodness, that's the most important thing. <laughs> yes. We don't know if, say you do the full 35,000. So for the next five years, you know, for simplicity, it, it takes you five years to roll over 7,000 a year. If there's another $35,000 in the account, can we add a different beneficiary and do it for them? We don't know yet. Okay. And the other question is, if you change the beneficiary, does that reset the 15-year clock? i just going to ask you the same question. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know yet. <laughs> okay. So, you know, the, the listeners who wrote this question, one of the reasons some people maybe aren't talking about it yet is because there's so many gray areas still. One of the most important gray areas there is, is how the states are going to treat this. So federal... We're saying from a federal tax perspective, there is no federal tax. That doesn't mean the states have to follow that. So actually, my home state, Indiana, has already come out and said, if this goes, or when it, it did go through, but we will probably recapture some of those tax credits. Indiana has one of the best deals for a 529 contribution. They do a tax credit, wow. 20% tax credit, not tax deduction. Yes. So Indiana, they've given this big benefit. They're saying... We're not fully on board yet. We might recapture those tax credits if you do this. Yikes. Because right, in, in essence, they are incentivizing college savings, right? So right. that's why they set this up as a, ultimately states could do tax deduction or tax credit, but that's why Indiana is, is really saying like, oh man, we really care about this. We're going to give you a tax credit. So for the listeners, the difference here, tax deduction just kind of comes out of your income. So let's say, like we were talking about before, let's say you're at a 10% marginal bracket, right? A $5,000 tax deduction is only worth $500 to you if your marginal rate is 10%. Whereas a tax credit is a dollar for dollar reduction in your tax liability. So let's say you owe $2,000 of tax liability to the federal government and you got a $1,000 tax credit, poof, in this case, half of your federal tax liability is gone. $1,000 is gone. There's $1,000 left. So you can see a tax credit is worth vastly more than a tax deduction. Yeah. And Indiana is essentially saying here, we gave you that tax credit in past years, but if you're going to do this, we might take it back. Yeah. Now it hasn't gone through yet. So you have to look at how your state is going to treat this, but that's a big unknown is if the states will follow suit and consider this a tax-free conversion or rollover, or if they are going to you know, enact some tax on this. Now, the other caveat here is another little rule for this is that you cannot convert over earnings from money put into the account in the last five years. Hmm. So we have to separate out those gains on contributions from the last five years. Who's tracking that? I have no idea. <laughs> Oh I don't goodness. think anyone has come out with a good way to no. track it. So they're they're trying very careful, and it makes sense for you know people not to try to use this as a way to get more money into Roth accounts. Um, you know, when their intention was never to save for education, they're trying to make it because there is a risk of unused five twenty nine funds. They're trying to give a solution to that, but they have to make it so airtight so nobody is using it for other scenarios. That's why we have all these little rules with it. And that certainly makes sense. So, I mean, let's actually look at prior to this. So before this 35K thing came into existence, I guess let's clarify when someone pulls money out of a 529, what's the tax on that? So like for both federal and state, like what are the ramifications of, okay, look, I put in $5,000 a year for my child's first 10 years. So I made $50,000 of contributions. Let's say hypothetically it doubled. It's worth 100K now. And I have a hundred thousand dollar five twenty nine, and I have to pay twenty five grand for year one of freshman year of college. Like, 
what happens in terms of like mechanically from there? If you're taking money out for education expenses, tax-free, you're good to go. If you're taking money out for anything that is not an education expense, you are taxed and penalized as a 10% penalty on the gain. So your contributions, you can always take back out. They're not going to be double taxed, but it's just the earnings of that money where there is that penalty and that tax that you will pay. Gotcha. Okay. And right. When the money went in each year, so that $5,000 in my hypothetical, you would have paid tax on that for federal, right? And then depending on the state and what the maximum state tax deduction is, you might have paid zero or minimal state income tax, right? Correct. So each state has their own rules. We already mentioned Indiana, which has a state tax credit. Most of them I see as a state tax deduction. And we're usually usually looking at limits at 10 to 15,000 for a married couple that you are allowed to deduct for state income tax. Some states don't have any deductions, don't have any benefits for using a 529. So you just have to look at it on a state by state basis. Okay. This all, all makes sense. And, and like you said, there's still a lot, <laughs> a lot we're waiting yeah. on. So I think your analysis of that was right, that like a lot of content hasn't been created around this online because it's just tough. It's tough when we don't have the answer. So we're excited that this exists. But like you said, it's not some like hack. There's no, <laughs> unless you're playing some crazy long-term game of like, okay, look, 15 years from now, I'm going to be able to do this at a fairly small amount at the end of the day, 35 yeah. years. Like if you're planning 15 years in advance for like, a kid who's maybe going to get scholarships and not need this. And so I can do this for 35,000. Eh, it's probably not worth the return on hassle there. But that said, I don't think most people are doing this. So for people who are concerned about oversaving, this can really make the difference, especially if it's going to be maybe 35,000 per account per beneficiary. Right. Like I'm we'll thinking see. about myself, right? <laughs> we will say, yeah, nobody knows. But like yeah. I have an account for each of my daughters. My wife has an account for each of, of our daughters. So are we going to get 135000 per both of them or are there going to be four thirty five thousands in essence? So we will see. Yeah. It's the first year that this went into effect. So they should be issuing guidance soon. We should be able to, to have a little bit more clarity, especially if they want people to use this. But we don't have those those answers yet. I think if you're in a scenario where you've had an account funded for 15 years, it's been at the same custodian, you just want to same beneficiary and you want to transfer it over and it seems like your state is okay with it, that might be the scenario where you can feel comfortable doing it now. Anything outside of that where you know you have you changed the beneficiary or you don't want to do it if you can only do it for one beneficiary, that we have to wait for guidance on. Okay. That makes sense. And like you said a few minutes ago, this is subject to the annual Roth contribution limits per year and the beneficiary has to have earned income over the amount that is converted, right? Yeah, whatever you're converting. So if you want to convert four, they have to have 4,000. If you want to do the full seven, they have to have at least 7,000 in earned income. Right. So this is not something, yeah, there's no gaming this. There's, so I, I, no. I like that, which is great, <laughs> right? Like that. this was a, I mean, obviously there's some gray area here, but you know, hopefully uh, they'll figure it out and we uh, will be back on a future mailbag to update it. So I think that was great. Let's move on to the next question. I guess while we're talking about 529s and I guess potentially college and children and such, Kelly wrote in, my wife and I have three girls, seven, four, and one, and I've got 529 set up already for all three. My grandparents are at the stage of their lives where they're trying to gift as much of their wealth to family as possible. So for the past few years, I've been depositing that money into each kid's 529 account. The oldest two girls have approximately $100,000 so far in their account, which I feel is plenty at their age. I'm wondering what to do with the money this year. Each kid has a check for $36,000. Would you keep pumping it into the 529? Should we set up their own bank account? Can we deposit into my wife and I's account? And we can put it into a brokerage account, something better. So in essence, Rachel, question, question, question. Like, what do we do? So this is clearly an enviable position. But Kelly is, is trying to figure out, like, where do they go from here? And also th there's that interesting thing of the 36,000, which maybe we can uh, touch on that because there's a uh, gift tax rules, right? So I suspect that's why that very arbitrarily seeming number of 36,000 is actually a very precise one. Yeah. So I guess we can address gift tax first. And this is where a lot of people get confused, but you can gift a certain amount, you know, every single year and the limit is 18,000 
for 2024 for single and then 36,000 for a married couple. Now, this is the confusion. That's not the limit. That's just the limit before you have to file a gift tax return. So a lot of people think, okay, that's what I can gift tax free. That's actually not true. It just means that if you gift over that amount, if you gift 40,000 to a grandchild, you now have to file a gift tax return because everybody has a lifetime gift tax limit. And so it's just going to subtract from that. So the 36,000 essentially is not subtracting from your lifetime gift tax limit, but anything above that would be subtracting. Yeah. And this is really, really important for people to understand. So there's the annual exclusion, and then there's the lifetime, basically gift and estate tax. It's the same pot basically for the the gift and estate. So like Rachel just said, every year there's this gift tax exclusion, which currently for 2024, it's $18,000 basically per person, per human, and then per person you're gifting it to. So let's just say my, this is not the case, but let's say my mom and dad wanted to give myself and my wife, Laura, the maximum. So my mom could give $18,000 to me my mom could give $18,000 to Laura. My dad could give $18,000 to me and $18,000 to Laura. So that's how it works. It's each individual can give to each individual, basically. And like Rachel said, it's basically just like, I think people actually probably go too far in terms of trying desperately to stay under that number. Because realistically, then all that happens if you go over is it just kind of gets subtracted out of your lifetime estate tax exclusion, which currently it looks like just from a quick research in 2024 per individual, it's $13.61 million or for a married couple, it's 27.22 million. So unless you're worried about having more than $27 million to give away, the gift tax and estate tax that you'll ever pay is $0. So it's actually just a record keeping issue. So, I mean, listen, if you have $100,000 to give away, and you feel like doing it, you're not, nobody's paying any tax on this at the end of the day, unless you have more than $27 million. Yeah. Estate tax is definitely one of those things where there's some weird fear around it when it applies to such a small percentage of the population. Now, granted, this is always on the chopping block. There's a lot of people who want to see that number brought down. There's always talks of it being halved. And then we'd be looking at, you know, 13 to 14 million. So really not a concern for most people. Now it's convenient. If you want to look at it from a convenience perspective, you don't have to file a gift tax return if you just stay under that limit. So you could certainly do that. But as far as just transferring wealth on, um, and again, I don't I don't know them, so I don't know their total estate. If it was really high, if it was 30, 40 million, they might be trying to gift during this time to avoid that. Or they might just be gifting because they prefer to see this used by their children, their grandchildren now. So as far as where should this money go and how should we direct it, they mentioned the 529s and how they're really built up already. And this is a perfect segue from what we just talked about with the risk of overfunding a 529. So sounds like the listener might be concerned about overfunding the 529, which is a valid concern because if we blow up this 529 to a huge amount and we can't take everything out for education expenses, then again, those earnings, they get taxed and penalized. And we only have about 35,000 here to play with to transfer over to the Roth. And we don't know if that's per child yet. (laughs) Right, right, right. But that's the concern. So then we start to think about, okay, what's the next step? So they bring up a brokerage account. I'm always a fan of a brokerage account for many reasons, just because of the flexibility. I don't know if this is important that the money stays in the, the children's name, but it sounds like they may have the option to put it in a brokerage account in the parent's name. The difference here that would be important is one, control over the account. So if you keep it in your name as the parent, you maintain control of it. So if you're concerned at all about you know, your child turning age 18 or 21, depending on the state, and then having all of this money at once, that's a valid concern, then you could retain control and distribute it as you see fit. Okay. So I actually just want to jump in real quick, Rachel. So In this case, let's say the grandparents gave the money to the children, but then could the parents create a brokerage account in their name with that money? 
So this is where we have to classify, is this a gift to the children or a gift to the parents? If it's intended to go to the children, then it should stay in the children's name. Again, okay. when we're thinking about that gift tax exclusion, yep. I don't know if they're gifting to the parents as well, right, right, right. Gotcha. but that would be a, a valid concern. Now, the Atma always gets brought up too. That's a, a custodian account that is owned by the child but the custodian retains control of it until the age of majority. And that's, again, 18 or 21, depending on the state. So a lot of people always wonder if they should fund an UTMA for their child. Again, we have that concern of, are you okay once your child reaches age of majority to have control over the account? Is there any way that you want to to be careful when your child access the funds? The other consideration here that's really important is FAFSA and how this is calculated. So anything that is in the child's name, any assets are going to be given a heavier weight in the expected family contribution calculator. So this is probably common sense, but when they're looking at this calculation, if the child has assets, they expect that child to be using a larger percentage of those assets to fund their education. So assets in the child's name are given a heavier weight than assets in the parent's name. So that's where we have to be careful is what are the assets owned by the child? What are the assets owned by the parents? Now, a really popular solution that a lot of people do for children's education is have a 529 or an account owned by the grandparents because that's not given any weight in the expected family contribution. So if they have that option, if you have that option where either you can be the custodian as the parent or the grandparent can be the custodian of a 529. And we believe we have a chance here with FAFSA and and giving aid to the child, then we would actually want to hold the assets in the name of the grandparents with the child as beneficiary. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes a ton of sense. So yeah, the, the FAFSA, this is something that's so important and yeah, it's a real bummer, but I think the last that I heard, and I, I believe this is accurate as of now, that assets in the child's name, so not in 529s, but just assets in the child's name gets essentially taxed. And it's not actual tax, but it's how I think about it. It's taxed at 50% for that effective family contribution. So if they have $40,000 in, a, like you said, a, a brokerage account, which might be that, that UTMA, U-T-M-A account, well, 20,000 of that is essentially the college is going to say, all right, you got to fork over 20,000. So I think of that as like a 50% college tax, which is just really, really unpalatable. And, you know, it's funny, Rachel, because we have set up these UTMA accounts for my, my kids. And I'm like, over my dead body is 50% of this getting taxed by a college that first year. Like my thought is they don't have a, a ton of money in there, but that money can be used for anything since it's it has nothing it's not a college account so like my older daughter is getting ready to drive and we we're thinking about getting her a car now i guess theoretically we could just take the money out of there and have her purchase a car that way and then 50 percent of it doesn't get taxed by college in two years yeah. that's a viable strategy right yeah when we put money in an atma it is an irrevocable gift to the child so when we do that, if we take money back out, it has to be for the child. Okay. So now an interesting, uh, and, and we don't want to get into the legalities of, of things, but my mind keeps spinning like, okay, well, does that mean that the car has to be titled in my daughter's name? Like, does she have to own oh, it? I wonder, I, I wonder. So we can't answer that on this, I, I assume, but needless to say, this is a brainstorm that I had about 45 seconds ago. And that's, what's fun about this is like, okay, you can think about this kind of stuff. And I'll obviously have to look into that based on what Rachel just said. So I'm not like jumping into doing this. But right, in that case, it would, you know, it very clearly would be her car and for her use. So, I mean, I think that passes the the smell test, but I I would need to look into that a little further. Yeah. You you know, sometimes I bring up FAFSA with clients and they kind of wave it and they say, hey, we're we're way above it. It, it. It's not even going to be a consideration as far as aid. We are just assuming that we are completely going to have to, you know, take care of that. So it might be a consideration for you. If you're close there, it might not be. That would be something where you have to look at your income, your assets, and see what your expected family contribution is. It might just be an irrelevant point. But they also bring up you know, a bank account. And so I, I think it's interesting to, to think about the point of the money and how it's going to be used. You know, When we talk about 529s, we're obviously assuming it's going to be used for education. But they ask about parking it in a bank account. And if the point 
is to build wealth for the child, for them to start their wealth building journey, then of course we'd want to look at investing the assets rather than having them sit in cash. There's that concern with a child who's very young and will have a very long time until they need the money that that money is going to lose to inflation. So unless that bank account was going to be used to spend the money immediately, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. But again, that's the question of what's the purpose of the money and how do we see our child using the money? Yeah. And in this case, Kelly's children are seven, four, and one. So like you said, I mean, if you were start investing this and it compounds over the next nine decades or yeah. thereabouts, like that's some real, real money. So another possibility is once they start having earned income, you can start putting money into Roth. So that can come. It doesn't have to be the literal dollar that you earned. Like it doesn't have to be that exact dollar bill. It can be any amount, but the the limit is the amount that you have as earned income. So that's a possibility to do for this extra money. And yeah, I mean, I think just kind of going back to the the general question is, yeah, I mean, look, you know, you've got a hundred thousand dollars in accounts for a seven year old and a four year old, and just with compounding. By the time that seven-year-old is 18, if that money hasn't doubled, right? If they if it's not 200 grand, something probably went terribly wrong with the investment strategy and and similar or really more so for the four-year-old then. So, I mean, for me, and again, you can never give advice. We don't know the situation. The student might be going to a four-year college at $100,000 a year, and then maybe they are under <laughs> undersaved. But for me, having 100K in an account for a seven-year-old and a four-year-old for college, considering any uncertainty and are they going to get scholarships, yada, yada, yada. Like, and, and I think there are some mitigating factors for that. So as I say it out loud, like, you know, I, I think there's potential ways that if you do get scholarships, there are some, some ways to access the money, yeah. but, but nevertheless, is a hundred thousand dollars enough for a seven-year-old and a four-year-old in a 529? I mean, for me, yes. I think hard stop, end of story. I would then start looking elsewhere. And like Rachel said, you can set up a brokerage account. I know we have Utmas, I believe, through Vanguard for my girls and just start investing in, in VTI or something similar is what we did and just kind of let it ride. And that'll be their account and it'll revert to them entirely when at that age of majority. And yeah, I mean, just think of it as what would you do for yourself? That's how I would approach that, Rachel. Yeah, I think I think that's a great idea. I mean, again, with the 529, it's like the Roth versus traditional where we're almost betting here. and. If we want to make a huge bet and say, well, I think my seven-year-old is going to go to med school and going to spend several six figures in college, and you bet big on the 529, they do that, you win because that's all tax-free money that's coming out. But the other scenario where that doesn't happen, where maybe they don't go to, to college at all, maybe they start a business, do something else, then we lose big. So I think for most people, we want to hedge our bets here, and most of us don't have that high of a risk tolerance where we're willing to bet that big. Totally agreed. And that's, yeah, that's basically how, how we did it for our own girls is at, at first we started saving a lot and then we're like, Oh, I don't really want to have all this money in the 529s. I and mean, we have obviously a significant net worth. So it's not like we went out and blew the money on, on, you know, dinners out or travel. Like we were saving the money. It was just in a different spot. So it was just more like we didn't want to get locked into something. So yeah. yeah. Lots of considerations, but I think we thoroughly answered Kelly's question there, which is great. So, all right, I think we have one more. So this last question came in from Gopal, and the question is, I just got married, and we both have our separate nine-to-five jobs and our own individual bank accounts, checking and savings. Now that we are married, I want to know whether we need to create another bank account, like a joint checking or joint savings account. Should we get rid of some of our individual accounts? If we get a joint account for some of the common household expenses for which we can pool money in our salaries, then since it is only for the monthly household expenses, should we simply opt for some brick and mortar like Bank of America or Wells Fargo or to make better sense to go with these online banks, which have a high interest rate? So there's a lot of questions here about like, all right, Rachel, they just got married, which is wonderful. Huge congrats. And it sounds like, you know, look, they had obviously separate financial lives and they're coming together. And... I guess the key word, and I I focus on this, this was not capitalized, but I I focus on the word need, Mm. right? So do we need to do this? That to me is the word that jumps out, out of a couple hundred there, right? So how do you think about this? How do you advise people? I know this is kind of like the third rail of, uh, of personal finance. Like some people retreat into their ideological corners of, you should never combine. You should always combine. Like, 
we don't play that game here at Choose a Vibe. We play the, all right, look, we're going to try to educate and, you know, you make the decision. But Rachel, how do you, how do you think about need to combine, want to combine? Is it good to combine? Yeah. You know? I, I think the strong opinions on this are always so interesting because to me, it's such a personal and a, a matter of convenience, really. What is most convenient for you and in, in your lifestyle? If you decide that you like to have some separation where you like your own spending account, that doesn't mean you're not taking a stance in any way. Now, if you have a spouse where one of you is working and, and one of you is is maybe a homemaker or taking care of your children, then I think that's a scenario where combining finances is often a, a good solution. But again, for me, it, it comes back over and over again to just what is convenient. And having these jointly owned accounts is very convenient because either of you can go to the bank or call the bank or you know take money out. It's just a matter of can you set up your financial lives in a way where it is convenient and organized for you? So you know, a common solution, a thing a lot of people do is just to combine everything. Let's throw everything in a joint account. All the bills will come out of there. We'll spend from there, put everything into a joint savings account, you know, and then have credit cards attached to these banks too, and just have everything, you know, pushed together. Because to be honest, this is how the IRS is looking at you. They look at a married couple as basically one person when it comes to taxes. And then From an estate planning perspective, I always like to bring this up with my clients, but it is really convenient to have a jointly titled asset. And again, these are scenarios nobody wants to think through, but if something were to happen to a spouse and the other spouse needed access to the funds, if it's jointly titled, they'd have access that day. So you do want to think about that as far as if something were to happen to me or something were to happen to my spouse, how difficult would it be to get this money? Because if if things don't have a beneficiary on it or if it's not jointly owned, we have to go through probate, it's expensive, it's inconvenient. And that's a, a really hard thing to go through when you're already going through a difficult thing. Now, a solution might be a jointly titled account and then individual accounts. Say you like to have some money just deposited into your individual account for spending on on hobbies you have and you just like it to be separate. That's fine. That's a way that you can organize it. Just again, make sure your beneficiary is your spouse for convenience. Yeah, that is so important. And we had an episode, maybe one of the absolute best and most important episodes of the entire 650 plus episode run here of Chooseify. It was episode 476 and it was entitled Love, Loss, and Money, The Shocking Financial Aftermath of a Phi Spouse's Death. And Amy came on and told her story. And it was uh, it was really, really just so sad and poignant and really speaks to what you said, Rachel, about like, look, even if you're married and you think everything's just going to go to the other spouse, just simple as can be, like, man, these states in the United States have some wacky rules depending on where you live. And just make sure you dot I's and cross T's, like make sure your beneficiaries are named explicitly and don't just assume, just make sure you do that. It's really, really important. And something you said in there was absolutely critical of like, look, if these are your, like your everyday accounts that you're using, don't just take the path of least resistance and say like, oh, look, our rent or our mortgage, it's always come out of this account. Like, that's your house. We moved into it together. Like, oh, let's just leave it. It's easier that way. No, no, no. Like, as sad as this is and as morbid as it can be, like, you have to think about what happens in the worst case scenario, right? So like, if that one person passes away, their stuff is is frozen. You don't have access to this, like at a moment's notice. And then what happens? Like, could you imagine the stress upon like a shock death? And then you're worried about like, is the mortgage getting paid? Is there money in there? Can I transfer money? And like, I can't do anything with this thing. Like, and the, the clock is ticking on this mortgage needing to be paid. Like, I mean, goodness, like I would say, and this is not, again, it's not like an ideological thing. It's just common sense. Like, let's just be smart about this. I wholeheartedly understand and agree with people having their own finances to some level. Like, do your thing, have your separate accounts, fund it with $50,000. I don't care. Like, do your thing. But I mean, you're married there are some practical ramifications of like, look, if things go south here in terms of someone getting severely injured or or passing, like you don't want to add financial stress to something just because you took the path of least resistance. So yeah, I mean, Rachel, that's how I think about it. Yeah. I mean, I think 
marriage is a much bigger commitment than adding somebody to your <laughs> bank account. So yeah, yeah, yeah. if that's the concern, we might want to rethink the whole <laughs> marriage thing. But honestly, I just always fall back to convenience and simplicity. I think that's the best financial plan. And when it comes to a married couple, time and time again, I see the most convenient and simple solution to be joining accounts. And again, to solve for that worst case scenario, I've just I've seen it before where a spouse has died and the other spouse has had difficulty getting access to the funds. You know, and the spouse who passed away doesn't want that. And most of us, I think, would never want to put our spouse in that situation. So we do have to run through these really sad scenarios, but just to make sure that our spouse is covered and and remember, you know, and even without that scenario, it is just so much more convenient to jointly own this asset and both have access and control over it. Yeah. Wholeheartedly agreed. And and yeah, some of like the more detailed questions here were like, do we need a brick and mortar? Do we need a large bank? Like, I mean, I gotta be honest, I don't know that it really matters. Like, I mean, if we're talking like to pay bills, I mean, yeah, you're in all likelihood not gonna be able to do that out of a high yield savings account that's online. So you're probably gonna want like a regular checking account. I'm agnostic to whether it's Wells Fargo, Bank of America, or your local credit union or a local bank. Like yeah. You do you figure that out. I don't think there's any like specified, like it has to be X, Y, and Z. No, I mean, I think this person will understand that checking, you don't really earn much money on savings you do. So put the amount in checking that you need to cover your expenses and not much more than that. And then put the extra cash into savings in a high yield savings account where it can earn the interest and then you're good. There's there's really not much to think about it beyond that other than FDIC insurance and make sure that your your cash is insured too. Yes. Very, very important. So, all right. We just went through a whole whole assortment <laughs> of interesting questions. I think that was a, a very thorough look through. So, Rachel, as always, I really appreciate you being here. And I know you have a lot of uh, irons in the in the fire. So, where, <laughs> among the many, <laughs> many places, where can people find you? Yeah. So, my business is Camp Wealth. So, I'm Camp Wealth at most places. Just started a YouTube channel, Camp Wealth, if you want to check that out. And then I have a podcast too uh, with my co-host, Matt Garrisick. That is called Becoming Work Optional. You can find it anywhere where you listen to podcasts. Very nice. And thank you for having me, Brad. It was such a great time. Yeah, of course. I love having you on. And uh, yeah, we're going to try to do these mailbags much more frequently. So uh, so no promises, obviously, to the audience if it's going to be 12 a year or six a year or whatever. But as you can tell, I love having Rachel on. And uh, yeah, we're going to just keep rocking and rolling with this. So until next time, thanks for listening to Choose a Vine.